Thank you, Madeline. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 66. Psalm 66. And thank you for all of the kind words and the texts and the Facebook messages and everything that you've done to say happy birthday, Pastor Bob. And, and thank you for the kind gift to uh, Texas, the restaurant. And we'll, we'll enjoy that. It's right by our house. And we look forward to that. And you know, it's been a joy uh, all these years to be with this church family nearly all the time. Now, Kelly and I did go down to Florida for about three and a half years or so and helped to get a youth ministry launched down there with a man that was instrumental in me coming to Jesus. But then uh, Mark O'Brien called me and asked if I would be open to coming back to our church. And so I told him, I said, well, let me pray about it. And so Kelly and I prayed about it, and I talked to my uh, father in the faith down there. When I say father in the faith, he's two years older than I am. <laughs> so he's not like 10 years older, but he's a dear, dear friend to this day. I've spoken for him on many occasions since then, and it's always a blessing to be with uh, all of my old church family in Florida from the early 90s. But, uh, you know, he, we, the other, let's see, uh, how many years? That was 83, so you're talking about 37 years, yeah. So uh, nearly all of those 37 years I've been with you all, and, um, and I, I couldn't ask for a better church family. Uh, I hear so many horror stories about all of these churches that there, there's all kinds of fights going on and things, and, and God's just been so good to us. We get together, we're like one big family. We love each other, and... Um, care for each other, take care of each other, and, and uh, you know, God puts a high priority on that. He said, I want you to be one as my father and I are one, and I think Ridgepoint is a unified body, and so I'm so thankful for all of you. All right, Psalm chapter 66. Uh, this is sort of a long chapter, but not too long to read it. It should take us a few minutes here to go down all the way to verse 20, but it's so great and uh, the psalmist is just calling not only Israel, but really the entire earth to praise the God who made everything, to glorify him and honor him. So I'm going to read this and follow along as I read aloud. Verse 1, make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Selah. Come. Oops, I forgot. I'm supposed to be changing these. <laughs> okay, here we go. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. He rules by, the pow by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. Selah. Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through the fire and through water. But you brought us out to rich fulfillment. I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals, with the sweet aroma of rams. I will offer bulls with goats. Selah. Come and hear, all you who fear God. 
and I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, but certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Well, I wanted to start with a little uh, personal testimony here. Um, when I was growing up, I grew up in a, in a uh, middle-class home outside Chicago. Um, I went to uh, the Roman Catholic Church every Sunday pretty much of my life growing up. And, um, and when I was in high school, uh, by the way, my mom and dad were tremendous uh, parents, and, and uh, they, they uh, were good, good people, they were moral people, and, and they wanted their kids to do what's right. But when I got into my teenage years, mainly my later teenage years, in fact, in my high school yearbook, if you go in my office and open the yearbook, Jeff told a lot of lies earlier this morning. He's kind of like a politician. But anyway, he, he, uh, he, he was talking about, if you looked at me, he'd go like, he doesn't look the same. <laughs> anyway, but other than that, my hair was way down, down on, on my back. But anyway, I had long hair. But... Um, Anyway, if you looked at my high school yearbook, my senior year, of course, they put, you know, was in the band, one, two, three, four, was this, one, two, was this, three, four, you know, the years that you participated, freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. In mine, it's very telling. It says, Robert Vesendak, uh, football, one, two, wrestling, one, two, baseball, one, two. And that's so sad, because what happened was, um, just by one, one afternoon, Satan was able to stick his foot in the door of my life. An older, a friend of mine, his older brother, uh, we were in his gigantic car. I forgot what it was, but it had to be something like a 64 Chrysler or something, because like... You could fit four people in the front and back seat and still have room between you. But anyway, so we have this car loaded with teenagers, but his brother was two or three years older, and he pulled out some marijuana and began to pass it around. And, you know, I was a junior in high school, and I, I looked at that, and due to the peer pressure, I just gave in instantly. I didn't want to be the only one out of, you know, a bunch of teenage guys to hey, you know, I don't do that. And so, you know, I got on drugs and my life spiraled out of control and got around the wrong people. And, you know, a couple of times I nearly died. I came that close, everybody, to dying and going to hell because I wasn't a believer yet. And, and I was overdosing and... It was, it was just an awful time in my life. And so for my junior and senior year, my first year at Purdue, when I was in college, for three years solid, it was just like uh, out of control. And, um, and so I'm so thankful that God was in control, though. It was because of God's mercies and grace that he didn't take me uh, he didn't take my life from me. It's because of his mercies that I survived that. It was because of his mercies. You know, when I finished my first year in college, I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get a job. There were jobs everywhere. All these steel mills, all of these factories all over Chicago, they were hiring people. Good money, too. I mean, like, like to, in today's money, like 20-some dollars an hour right off the street. And so I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get a job for like two weeks. I was putting my applications in everywhere. I'm like, man, what's going on? Well, then finally I got a job, of course, at the factory where I ended up getting saved. Well, God had plans. God was in control. I was out of control. I was crazy. But, um, but 
God was in control, and he brought me to the place, to the very factory where I heard the good news for the first time in my life. Hey, folks, think about this. There was a time in my life when people said, are you saved? I said, what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> I remember saying that. I had no idea what the word saved me meant. And, uh, but that's just the way it was, because the church I grew up in, they never talked about being saved or being born again, being uh, forgiven of your sins forever and ever. And so nonetheless, but at that factory, I would say probably within two weeks of getting a job there, I uh, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then within two weeks after becoming a believer, you know what? I just said, phooey on the old Bob Vesendak, you know? Those days of partying and getting stoned and, and doing all kinds of evil and craziness, I said, those are over. My, I'm, putting, I'm putting my life on the altar for God. I remember it was in July of 1979, two Sundays after I got baptized, and uh, early July. And from that point on, man, I said, Lord, I'm, I'm going strong for you. And... Um, and you know what? Uh, thank God he's been able to help me stay on the straight and narrow. Uh, not perfectly, of course. None of us could, could say that. But basically, I just look back and see so many ways along all these 60 years that God has, has intervened. I think about, you know, like uh, about, let's see, how many years? 2003, 17 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but 17 years ago, I'm standing here starting a series on First Peter, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the sermon, I was like, Peter, humble. Well, for a minute and 20 seconds, you sat there. <laughs> I saw like 500 eyeballs. <laughs> that big, God, I sit there for a minute and 20 seconds. I talked just like that. I could not form sentences. And of course, I found out I had a brain tumor. And, and you know what, folks? Like I thought yesterday on my birthday, I thought, you know, Lord, to go through brain surgery and to come out with very few side effects, you know, I have side effects from it, but they're very small. And, uh, and to be able to still enjoy life and see your kids grow up and walk your daughters down the aisle and to see your grandkids. This past Wednesday, my four-year-old grandson put his faith in Jesus, got saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, Nicole was walking him through the gospel day after day, week after week, and she was always telling him, hey, Ethan, when you're ready, just come and let me know. And uh, let me know when you're ready to put your faith in Christ. And this past week, he came and said, Mom, I'm ready. <laughs> so she was so elated. She's just crying. And, and then what was so cool, last night after we had dinner as a family for my birthday, my birthday dinner last night, it was so great. A, a girl Nicole like hadn't seen, I don't know, in 15 years since they were working at Lifetime Fitness up in North Garland up there during high school when she was still in high school. She saw this girl and she's married. That, that lady has several kids and and or at least two kids, Kelly, they have two, yeah. And uh, anyway, the woman told uh, Nicole before we all broke in different directions, she said, Nicole, thank you so much for sharing the gospel with me when we were in high school. She said, I've become a believer and I'm serving the Lord. And you know, it was just a really, what a, what a great thing. You know, remember I've said at the very beginning of this year, we just are seed planters. We plant seeds and one day God might have somebody else water them. And we'll, a lot of times you don't get to hear things like that until you get to heaven. But Nicole got to hear that before that. So, so anyway, I want to talk about this idea of God being in control. I was out of control. God brought my life back into control and gave me a reason to praise him, to live for him, to glorify him, to just want to live completely surrendered to him. Hey, everybody, you all listening out there, are, do you want that for your life? Do you want to just live completely surrendered to him till the day you go to see him? Or are you still thinking, well, you know, I'm just not sure I want to turn over that much control to God. I just don't know if I want him to be Lord of my life, you know. I'm just not sure. Well, maybe today you'll change your mind. But this is the title that I've given 
for our message today, how God shows he's in control. How God shows he's in control. We're going to look at that from Psalm 66, and I hope that you'll leave today saying, man, I really needed that. I needed to hear that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get right into this message, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper. Father in heaven, we pray that you'll use this message in all of our lives, Lord. We pray that, God, you'll be honored and glorified through these words and that your people will be helped, encouraged, rebuked, whatever is needed, Lord. But, Lord, we just pray that they'll take it to heart and say, yes, I want Jesus to be in control of my life, the Lord of my life. I want him to rule how I live what I say, and what I think. And we pray it in your precious name, Jesus, and for your sake. Amen. Well, around the year 2005, researchers in England started to go out on the streets, door to door, and they were knocking doors, talking to people on the streets. And they were asking people, they were interviewing people just at random about their beliefs about God. And so one of the questions on the list that they asked people was this. Do you believe in a God who intervenes in human history, who changes the course of affairs, who performs miracles and so forth? Do you believe in a God like that, a supernatural, a miracle-working God? Well, when the, when the study was published, the whole study itself took its title from one of the responses of a man on the street. It took its title... Uh, from a man who was seen rather typical of those in Great Britain who responded. And this is how he answered that question. Do you believe in a God who intervenes in human history, works miracles, so on and so forth? And this is what that man said. He said, no, I don't believe in that God. I believe in the ordinary God. I don't believe in that God. I believe in the ordinary God. And you know what, everybody? When you read Psalm 66, it's clear that the unnamed writer of this psalm, it doesn't say it's written by David, the the writer is not named. So whoever the author of Psalm 66 was, we all know ultimately it was God Almighty, but God Almighty breathed his word out and and, uh, a, a human being wrote that down, okay, as he was borne along by the Holy Spirit. But we don't have his name. But it's clear that that person was someone who did not believe in the ordinary God. No way. I mean, we read it earlier, and we're going to kind of go through it again somewhat here. But there's no way that you could say that of the psalmist in Psalm 66. In fact, he's so moved by the greatness of God, like I said earlier, that he begins to call all the nations on earth. (laughs) He's saying, hey, listen, all the earth, listen up, I want you, I'm singing God's praises, I'm thrilled about how God has worked in my life, I was lost, but now I'm found, I was blind, but now I see, I understand why I was created, so on and so forth. You get the idea. And he's wanting the whole world to experience that. You know what, everybody, listen, I know it's really difficult. And sometimes, as conservative, Bible-believing people, we can watch things on TV and we get really angry at what people without God say and what they do and what they think. But you know what? We always got to remember, there's a sense, now don't get me wrong, Paul talked about these people are the enemies of God. They're... God definitely has enemies on earth. There's people that are up to no good and are being used as pawns of the devil. There's no doubt about it. But so many people are just blinded. You know, they haven't entered into any kind of pack with the devil. They haven't uh, said in their hearts, you know what, I'd just like to see all the churches shut down. I just like to see their doors closed. There's, there's some people like that. And yeah, we could probably on people like that put the tag, the enemies of God. And then, of course, you know, when, when we're unsaved, there's a sense in which the whole world is an enemy of God because you're not believing in him. But there is also a technical sense where there are some people that fall in that category, and Paul named them. 
He said, these people are the enemies of God. Paul called out a lot of names, which is real interesting. A lot of times the Christian people and pastors say, oh, you shouldn't be calling other Christians' names out. Well, let me just tell you this. If somebody's famous and they're on TV and they're leading a lot of people astray, yours truly is going to tell you what that person's name is, all right? I'm going to follow in Paul's footsteps instead of, uh, you know, some other guy that, that's famous. And he's, oh, we shouldn't be that way. We should love everybody. No, you need to, the Bible says reprove, rebuke, exhort. Preach the word. Reprove, ex rebuke, exhort. <laughs> rebuke, you know. Paul called people its names. So, anyway, God wants even these people, like we were just referencing, these people that are not very pleasant, that get you, get your gruff, that get you angry because they believe in such ungodly things. You know, there's a sense in which we have to have a balance there because, you know what, we really need to see them for who they really are. They're people that are blinded by Satan. They're people who don't understand God. They don't understand the things of God. They don't understand God's ways. And so we have to think clearly. And so the psalmist in Psalm 66 is just out there saying, I want everybody to get in on this. Is he saying, hey, is he saying that everybody's going to get in on it? No. Is he saying everybody's going to one day worship and praise God? No, he's not saying that. And he knows better than that. And he knows most undoubtedly most people are not <laughs> he said you know there's a whole lot of nations around Israel here and I don't see any of them rushing to become like us <laughs> and be a, a salt and light in the earth okay so Israel's telling the nations around them that if they would take a good look at what God's done for Israel then they may want to praise God like Israel is praising God okay now notice what Israel, through the psalm writer here in Psalm 66, notice what he's saying to the entire earth. Okay, he's saying this to all mankind. And yes, I underlined the verbs up here. So I want you to notice, he's saying to the whole world, verse 1, make a joyful shout. Do that. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. In other words, basically, man, with all of your heart and soul, sing out to God. Now, Maybe the reason he's doing this, maybe he's kind of doing some pre-evangelism here. They might say, well, why would I want to do that? What has God done for me? Well, he's going to go into that. So first, he's just telling them to do all these things. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Verse 2, sing out the honor of his name. Verse th uh, 2 again, make his praise glorious. By the way, Sandy Patty, if you want to get on YouTube later after church and you want to uh, put in Make His Praise Glorious, Sandy Patty, the singer, and listen to an amazing song from the 80s. Oh, my goodness, it's based on Psalm 66, and she cranks it out. I mean, man, it is amazing. Kelly and I got to see her last year in uh, Richardson at a church, and it was so, so great to, to see her giving praise to God all these years later. Okay, verse 2, Make His Praise Glorious. Verse 3, say to God, how awesome are your works. Verse 5, come and see the works of God. Jesus said that, come and see. You remember he said to his disciples, or actually, I'm sorry, I think in one case, it was one of the disciples saying it to his brother, Andrew and Peter maybe, come and see, <laughs> see Jesus. Verse 8, oh, bless our God, you peoples. Verse 8, make the voice of his praise to be heard. All right? By the way, let me just give you a little, little time of teaching here. Praise is, uh, is kind of the idea of this, everybody. Praise isn't like Thanksgiving. It's different, though it's close to it. Thanksgiving is just thanking God for what he's done for you. But if you want to praise God, that doesn't mean to stand somewhere and just say, praise you, praise you, Lord, praise, praise you, praise. No, what he means by praise God is to sing his praises to others. Uh, you know what it means to sing somebody's praises? Jeff came up here and he sang my praises earlier. Like I said, it was a lot of lies with a little bit of a cherry on top of truth. Okay, now, anyway, but what I'm saying is, is this, is that 
When you praise somebody, you sing their praises. Oh, you know what? God is just so awesome because, you know what? He saved me. He took me out of a horrible pit. He put my feet on solid rock. He established my paths. He's put a new song in my mouth. Praise to God. Okay, that's singing somebody's praises. Right there, I was singing God's praise. So just keep that in mind. When you read praise, you know, like, I don't think Kelly would get a big kick if she came home from work one day, and I'm standing in the kitchen, and I just say, praise you, Kelly. Praise you. Praise you, praise you, praise you. Praise you, praise you, praise you, praise you, praise you. You know, she would be like, Bob, what's the matter with you? Did you take, you know, too much ibuprofen? Or, you know, okay, so she would be wondering what was going on there, but, um, but that's not, but you know what, if I, if I sat down to eat with her and I said, hey, Kelly, you know what, boy, you've been just working so hard, and, uh, and man, I'm so thankful you, you, you know, all my clothes are clean and they're all, they're all folded. Like when she goes on a trip and I do the wash and fold the clothes, <laughs> my folding is different from her folding. You know, like if you look at my t-shirts, they're all like in, they're like uh, quadrilaterals, parallelograms, uh, octagonal, uh, all kinds of different mathematical shapes of shirts. But like hers, man, they're all like in perfect squares. They're, yeah, like when you open them up, there's no wrinkles. When you open mine up, like, woo, look at, man, the whole thing is really wrinkly. And so, but if I started talking to her about saying, you know what, you did this, and, and you know, I'm so thankful for this, and, and boy, you know what, you've, and I start singing her praises, well, you get the idea. That's what we mean in the psalm. So that was a little of an aside from what I was really talking about today, but not really, but, but uh, in one sense, it's, it goes right along with it. Okay, so this is the kind of evangelism that Israel's doing to the whole earth. Israel saying, listen up, nations of the earth, if you would just look at what our amazing God has done for us, you would believe he's the one true God and worship him like we do. You know, one time a professor was asked about the best argument he could give that the Bible is true. What's the best proof the Bible is true? And the professor said, that's easy, Israel. That's easy, Israel. And what he meant by that, of course, was Israel was just, from time immortal, hated everybody. In the Bible, it even says, back in the days of King David, they wanted to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And guess what? The Ayatollahs in Iran are saying the same thing to this very day. They probably say it every day. We want to wipe Israel off the face of the map. God has been so good to Israel. He's maintained Israel. He promised Israel, you're going to be famous in the earth. You're going to bring forth the Messiah. You're... And so God could not let Israel go out of existence. That's why that professor said, I can tell you the best proof of the truth, the veracity of the Bible, that it's truthful. Just the nation of Israel. 2,000 years later, it continues when millions have wanted to destroy it. So God shows he is in control. Okay, here's a major point here today. God shows he's in control through the amazing ways he delivers his people in their time of trouble. Okay? Earlier I talked about this brain surgery I have. You know, before you go into surgeries, they tell you all the things that can go wrong. They have to sit you down and say, okay, with this surgery, you know, this can happen to you, and that can happen to you, and this can happen to you. Man, when you have brain surgery, it takes like 10 minutes. All right, you can be completely paralyzed. You can lose your sight. You could lose your ability to speak, the ability to hear. You could be, you know, they go down this long list. You can die. You know, you, you, you can go into surgery and never come out. And they go through the whole thing. And you know what? But when you come through that, and, you know, especially a pastor, when he gets his ability to speak back, when you, you know, had this tumor pressing on your brain, keeping you from being able to speak correctly, man, that's a reason to shout the praises of God, shows his power, his control. And now, every time I have a birthday, man, I'm just like, Lord, I'm just thankful to be alive. I should have been dead 17 years ago. 17, nothing. I should have been dead 40 years ago when I was overdosing on dope, 
I mean, God has saved me. And by the way, he gave me a wife that's got really good reflexes, and she's probably saved me from like 450 car wrecks and probably about two dozen deadly car wrecks where I would have gone through the windshield, you know, because like, you know, she's just got like, and the thing that frustrates me is that I'm right, I'm right with her. She's shouting, you know, she's screaming while I'm, at, while it's hitting me in the brain, okay? I know it in my mind. I just haven't said, whoa, yet. So it's like I get the signal from her at the same time it's hitting me in the brain. But, but you know, I, I appreciate it, though, because like when your car's hurtling like to a, toward a tree, toward a big block of concrete on the side of the road and different things, it's nice to have somebody say, look out! Okay, so... And then, you know, the free earwax cleaning when you hit 60 is a really nice thing to have as well, you know, to have the wax cleaned out of your ears. But anyway, so God shows he's in control through these amazing ways he's delivered us. And you know what, everybody? We're never going to really know until we see the Lord Jesus. Oh, is it going to be wonderful? He's going to say, look, Bob, uh, I've got it written down here, Bob, but here, I, I uh, saved you from dying uh, 222 times before you were 20 and 895 times after you were 20. <laughs> He's going to know all of them. He'll be able to go through all of them. But you know what? We'll find out all the blessings he sent our way, how he's delivered us in different ways. Hey, we, have, have we all eaten today or yesterday? Amen. Have we, do we have, a, we have a closet full of clothes that's got way too many in it? We can't, we can't get rid of what we need to get rid of, you know? You know, we got suits in there that have been in there since 1988. Yeah, but I may, I may be able to wear that again one day. I may be slim down and be able to wear. Yeah, man, I'm telling you what. <laughs> there is no way that I'm gonna fit. I don't care if I fasted for 40 days. I don't know if something happened, but there's no way I'm fitting into those pants. You know, you pull them out and they're like, what? <laughs> they're about that wide. I'm like, that's like one leg now, man. What's it? What's the? Anyway. Okay, so for thousands of years, God's enemies have desired to wipe Israel off the face of the map, but he hasn't allowed it. Now, notice verse 3, he's protected them, and he's protected you and I. Verse 3, through the greatness, through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Okay, what's going to happen to God's enemies? What's going to happen to the enemies of Israel? What's going to happen to the enemies of godly people? What's going to happen to those people? Well, God tells us. Right now, I'm going to protect you from them. Not completely, but as much as I need to for you to do my will. I'm going to be watching over you. You won't die. You won't die a day before I planned it. Now, that doesn't count if you become an idiot, okay? If you, you know, like if uh, Bird and I climbed up the, the uh, platform out here, 35 feet tall, and we were on the top, and we both jumped off, the, uh, the outcome would be the same. Splat and splat, right, Bert? There's Okay, that's just stupid, you know? I'm talking about as we go through life and we're honoring God and things, God just like, God's like, hey, listen, I've got you covered. I, know, I brought you into this life. I chose the day of your birth, and I know the day that you'll die, so don't worry. Everything's in my control. Everything's in my control. You know, by the way, going back to the brain surgery, when I was in there with that robe on that you have to walk sideways so nobody can see your backside, you know, you know I'm coming into that with all my friends, like 40 people in that room, and I'm sitting there, and you know what? about to have them cut my head open, and I felt like a kid in a candy store. God's peace was amazing. I was sitting there, and I had no nervousness, no, I, I, look, I'm like, for me to live is Christ and Kelly and Nicole and Lauren and my church family. To die is gain. I can't go wrong either way. I'm blessed both ways. And so, you know what, I just sat there, and of course it wasn't because I was working it up, it's just because God was so powerful and so real to me then that I just sensed his hand of 
care and his protection. People praying over me. Verse 5, how else? He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. The sons of men is humanity. He is awesome in his doing toward humanity. How? He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. Who's that? It's the Exodus. It's Israel. He said, listen, Pharaoh's chariots are coming upon them. And so what does God do? He puts a wall of fire up. He blocks off God's enemies. And then he parts the Red Sea. And they cross on dry. Not mushy. Mushy. You know, two foot deep mud. No, on dry ground. They walked across. They got on the other side. And then Pharaoh and his armies were let loose and they got in the middle of the sea and God brought the sea right across God's enemies. Amazing, amazing. He delivers in many ways, but that's one of his greatest. Verse 7, how else? He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Guess what, everybody? God's got his eyes on all the nations on earth. He's moving the chess pieces around, okay? He knows what's going on in the world. He's in control. Nothing's going to happen that God goes, oops, how did that happen? Oh, my goodness. No, no. God is in total control. If thus and such happens in another country or thus and such happens in America, okay, the coronavirus was not like, you know, it, wasn't, it didn't surprise God. And went, oh, my goodness. How did that happen? No, no. God's in total control, okay? You say, but Pastor Bob, what if somebody did invent that? What if it's true that people in uh, Wuhan, China, what if they, uh, I think that's right, uh, what if they designed that and, and then it got loose or they made it go loose? What if, that, what if that was really the case? Then God allowed it. And by the way, when I was in prayer this morning, early this morning, I was thinking to myself, you know, God is using coronavirus as a massive megaphone to wake people up. You don't control when you live and die. God controls that. You may die from this. You may get this and not survive it. Oh, that's not going to happen to me because I'm young. And I, you know what? I mean, listen, it could happen. It could happen to me. It could happen to you. I mean, yeah, we're God's children. But we could get that. I mean, that's just, a, that's just a true thing that could happen to us. And we may, you know what, we may survive it. We may not survive it. By the way, a couple of our missionaries, they were supposed to leave on October 22nd, just in a few days. Five more days, or six, four more days, they were supposed to go back to Cambodia. They just got their visas. Everything's lined up. Guess what? They both got COVID. Now it's going to be delayed till December 22nd. They got to go through. They got to pay more money for their tickets. They got to let got to get Cambodia to let them get let them back into the country and all of this stuff. It's just but see God is in control. And they, you know what? They're praising him. They're like, "You know what? God and, and you know the in Carol Carol Hartsfield, her dad just died last Friday. And she's in the email. She's praising God. Yeah, we have COVID, but you know what? And then um, Carol and Victor. Victor's mom and dad got COVID too, and they're in their 80s. But they're singing God's praises. You know, we're trusting in God. He's going to get us back to Cambodia. You know what? That's the way we need to be. We need to be praising God and trusting him. Okay, what else did God do? Look at this. Um, he keeps our soul among the living, and he does not allow our feet to be moved. Now, I normally see the word keeps in our Bibles and take the word guards there. He guards our lives among the living but this word i looked it up and it's actually he places our soul our life the word soul is like the word life our lives our life he places our life among the living in other words god is the one who gives you life god's the one who has you be born through your father and your mother okay god is the one who places you among the living and does not allow our feet to slip to be moved to slip, to stumble. In other words, what that means is, and I, I'm taking, taking it that this is inferring that as long as you are walking closely to him, you don't have to 
by God's grace. You don't have to stumble into the ditch of sin, stay there, and die there. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to go through that. God can keep you relatively victorious. Okay, let's, right? Is it, are we all on the same page with that? God can keep you relatively victorious. Nobody can say, I have perfect victory. No, nobody has perfect victory. That's a lie. If anyone says he does not have sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. 1 John 1. But you can say, you know what? God's really given me amazing victory. Thank you, Lord. So on and so forth. Okay, so you get to verses 10 through 12. You get to verse 12. You've caused men to ride over our heads. Woo, that sounds horrible. Somebody run over your head with their car, you know. I mean, right? This is hyperbole, okay? So this is like the idea of, man, they've clobbered us. They've trampled on us. Uh, we went through the fire and through the water, you know, floods and fiery furnaces. This is metaphorical, man. God's taken us through the worst times that people can go through, uh, you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Look at that. We went through some of the horriblest times, but Lord, you brought us out to abundance. Lord, you brought us out. You know, just like I'm saying today, man, I had to go through that tumor and, and all of the surgery and all the recovery and everything, but you know what? God brought me back to share in his word, to sing in his praises, to play in the guitar, Bert. God brought me back to rich abundance. I've come to give you life and to give it to you, what everybody? More abundantly, more abundantly. So the purpose of the nations, listen, the purpose of the nations around Israel was to destroy Israel. The nations wanted to destroy Israel, but God in his sovereignty used their oppression to purify Israel. Did you all get that? So the bad things we go through, Maybe somebody in your office, maybe somebody in your neighborhood. They're just putting you through the worst of times. But guess what? God can take their, their purposefulness to hurt you and use it to purify you. Yeah. And so we have to trust God. Man, when things aren't going the way we want them to go, Lord, purify me, burn up the crud in my life. God uses trouble in our lives to bring about good that we might shout his praises to the world around us of what a great deliverer he is. Paul said in Romans 8, 28, we're almost done here. I consider that the sufferings of this present time, okay, that's all that we go through. You know, things are going along well for us, then the bottom drops out. I, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, in other words, our lives on earth, are not worthy to be compared with the glory, or you could use the word honor, not to be compared with the honor which shall be revealed in us. Boy, the honor that God is going to bestow on you and I when we honor him in our hard times and in our good times God has, you read, read Revelation 2 and 3. I just listened to it this morning on my iPhone. But I was hearing all the things Jesus is going to do. He who overcomes and keeps my works till the end. He that overcomes, she that overcomes, those that overcome. I'm going to do this and this and this, and I'm going to make you a pillar in my temple, and I'm going to do this. Wow, all that honor. Paul said, listen. I think, in fact, I think in the Message Bible, which is, a real, really strong paraphrase of the Bible, but it's often on the money. Eugene Peterson some, said something like here, if I'm remembering correctly, he said, the sufferings of this present life are small potatoes <laughs> compared to what's coming down the pike. It was something like that. I remember that, small potatoes, an idiom of modern speech. I like what Professor Dave Osborne at Denver Seminary said, everybody. Too often we try to use God to change our circumstances when he is using our circumstances to change us. <laughs> Isn't that great? We often try to use God to change our circumstances while he is using our circumstances to change us. Okay, so God shows he's in control through the amazing ways he delivers his people in times of trouble. All right, now, 
Let me wrap it up here, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper. What should our response be? Okay, after all that I've said, that God's worthy of our praises, he's worthy of us singing his praises to the people around us, to telling others about how great he is. Uh, well, verses 13 to 20 tell us we should do what the Old Testament saints did. We're not going to go into all the details because there's a lot of stuff there in those eight verses. But what I want to do is just give you two major things that we ought to be engaging in here, okay? The first one is gratitude. We ought to be grateful to God. We ought to get up every day and say, Lord, it's because of your mercies that I'm not destroyed. Because your compassions for me never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's the kind of thing God wants to see in our life. Not, oh man, this is going to be a lousy day. Yesterday was awful, but tomorrow, today it's going to be even worse. I just know it, and this is going to happen to me, and it's going to be so hard. Man, if you think like that, you're going to drown yourself in all kinds of negativity. Glorify God. Give him praise. Give him thanks. Be grateful. I, I pulled this out of the Net Bible because I love the way the Net Bible put it. Come, listen all you who are loyal to God, I will declare what he's done for me. I cried out to him for help. Okay, do you cry out to God for help when you need it? I cried out to God for help, and I praised him with my tongue. I cried out to him, I said, help, Lord, and then I began to tell him why I want his help. Lord, you're so faithful, you're so kind, you're so, so wonderful to us, but I just need you. So he's singing his praises. He's singing God's praises as he cries out for help. Verse 18, this is so important. The psalmist tells you and I, if I had harbored sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Okay, do you all get that? If you need help and you're harboring sin in your heart, which means you're just living in a certain way that you know God's not pleased with. Like, for instance, you're not making enough money, and so you're taking money out of the drawer at work, and you're stealing from your employer. And you know you are. But you say, well, I've got to do it to pay the rent. No, you don't need to do it. Trust in God. Trust in him to provide. Don't steal, because you know what you're doing? You're just digging a deeper hole. So if you allow a sin like that, let's just use that as an example, if you're harboring that in your heart, the Lord will, would not have listened. He said, if I had done that, the Lord wouldn't have heard my cry. Help! God would have been like, sorry. <laughs> okay? So he can't help us if we're rebelling against him. Now again, I'm not talking about the typical daily sins that we do as we walk with God. I'm talking about full-throttled rebellion, where people are doing things they just know aren't right, and they're not planning on giving them up. Okay, so you get the idea. Now, verse 19, however, he says, God wouldn't have listened to me, however, God heard. <laughs> I love that. God heard me. I cried out for help, and he heard me. He listened to my prayer. God deserves praise, for he did not reject my prayer or abandon his love for me. Gratitude. He deserves our praise and our thanksgiving. Okay, that's the first thing that we take home. The second thing here is this. Share what he has done for us with others. That's another thing we should do. In the Old Testament, it all revolved around the Exodus, the opening of the Red Sea. That was the main thing that Israel could look back in their history, even hundreds, even thousands of years later, and they could say, our God is the God that didn't let us as a nation, die. Egypt did not destroy Israel totally and wipe us off the face of the map. We continue because of the Red Sea miracle. The Red Sea miracle. That's how they witnessed to the people around them. You can know this God. You can know his love. You can know his forgiveness. You can know. And they learned those things through the prophets. Okay? That's why when you read the Old Testament, you say, there's no gospel in the Old Testament. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of hidden. <laughs> it's there, and then a lot of it came as the prophets were standing up, and God was directly giving them the word of God to share with people. Well, you know, like, for instance, we, we know 
Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Okay, he, he got eternal life. He got righteousness. But it doesn't tell us the words that God gave to Abraham. Obviously, God explained the gospel to Abraham. Hey, one of your offspring, a couple thousand years from now, several thousand years from now, are going to give birth to the Messiah and he is going to die for your sin. Okay, so, so God, God undoubtedly told Abraham the gospel. But we won't go into that. Okay, so the way the New Testament, we do this in the New Testament, everybody, we have the privilege of sharing with others how God saved us from eternal hell, from the bondage of sin, through Christ's death, and our faith in Christ for eternal life. Okay? All right. Well, at this time, I'd like us to share the Lord's Supper. Those are the two takeaways. Be grateful and sing God's praises to the people around you. Don't be ashamed. Don't, uh, don't uh, uh, think that... Uh, that it's something that uh, uh, is out of the ordinary. Just share it and, and let the chips fall where they may. You know what? I don't have, I don't see any more. Are there any more uh, um, communion cups? Matt or Marilyn, would you mind getting me one? Thank you so much. I didn't grab one. I should have. I want to tell you a story before we take the, the wafer. I want to share a story. By the way, if anybody else needs one, Jeff will get them to you. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Lord bless. Okay. Anybody else need one? Okay. Kelly needs one, Jeff. On St. Patrick's Day last year, not in 2020, but on St. Patrick's Day in 2019, a woman was in need of a life-saving assist in a Chicago area restaurant. This lady was definitely in the right place at the right time. Okay. By the way, you know in Chicago, the river that runs through the middle of the city, uh, the Chicago River, they dye it green. It's bright green for St. Patrick's Day. I mean, that's a big deal up in Chicago because there's a lot of, of uh, people up there that are Irish. And boy, they, they, they do it up, okay? So anyway, here's this lady. She's at the restaurant, and she was in bad, bad straits. A last-minute staffing issue left the restaurant, whose name was the Trifecta Grill, in need of a busboy to fill in during the busy, busy holiday weekend. Okay? It was crazy in Chicago because of St. Patrick's Day. This girl that was working there, she was either an older teenager or a college-aged girl, she realized, oh my goodness, we don't even have a busboy to bust the tables. Her dad, who was a cardiologist, retired at this point. He wasn't a doctor, uh, you know, going to work every day. He's in his retirement. She calls her dad. She says, Dad, can you come to the, to the restaurant right now? Can you come to Trifecta? Ah, we need you, Dad. You know what? I know that uh, this, is, this is a big, big thing to ask you, but can you come and put on this white apron and go to the tables and take the dishes to the people in the kitchen that are washing the dishes? Well, believe it or not, his name was, uh, her name was Al Alina Benj, and uh, her dad's name was Dr. Bill Benj. He's a Harvard-trained cardiologist. <laughs> so she calls a Harvard-trained cardiologist and says, can you come and be a busboy? And he says, okay. You know, he's kind of probably, he doesn't have a lot to do at this point. Now, the bartender, whose name was Nicole Papalia, she said this. This isn't funny, but what happens if there's some medical event and he just happens to be here that night? We were all kind of joking about that. She was talking to the reporter and she was saying, to the reporter, you know, this isn't really something that's funny, but we were all joking about when we heard that he was going to come and bust tables. We said, yeah, just think of something really happened and we needed a doctor. Okay. But just after he arrived for his first stint as a busboy, a customer, an older lady, she began choking on her meal. No kidding. Five minutes after the guy comes and puts the white apron over his head, the Harvard-trained cardiologist, some ladies over there, you know, and she, she's having big troubles, all right? And she can't get, you know, the, 
chunk of, you know, let's see, it was St. Patrick's Day, so we'll say it was probably, uh, uh, what is it, Kelly? Yeah, corned beef, and uh, corned beef and cabbage, you know, she got a big chunk of corned beef there, stuck in my eight orts, <laughs> the bears, okay, no, not that one, anyway, okay. But he wasn't there for more than five minutes. He said, this is what he said to the reporter. He said, instead of clearing tables, I went over to clear a blocked air passage. Quote, I performed the Heimlich maneuver, and the woman was able to clear the object. Doesn't that sound like a doctor? I performed the Heimlich remover, and the woman was able to clear the object. <laughs> okay, good, okay. Now, his daughter told reporters, now this is what I, this is the reason I'm telling this story for the Lord's table. His daughter told reporters, quote, I kind of go back in my mind and say, what if he wasn't here? How would that have turned out? What would the outcome have been? The woman was so fortunate that my dad was here that night. You know what? A good chance that she might have died. If nobody in that restaurant knew how to do a Heimlich maneuver and she couldn't get that out on her own by gasping and choking and trying to do, you know what? She might have lost her life. Very possible, especially being older. Now, I want us to take that and apply it spiritually. This was a Harvard-trained cardiologist. What if the Son of God, what if the King of Kings and Lord of Lords says, I'm not walking those dusty streets. I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm worshipped by 10,000 times 10,000 angels. I'm not going down there, Father. No way, no way I'm taking upon me the form of a servant, a slave. I'm not going to be anybody's slave. I'm the king of kings and lord of... You know what? This girl said, what would have the outcome have been if my dad didn't decide to humble himself? Folks, what would the outcome have been for us if Jesus wouldn't have humbled himself and became obedient to death and become obedient to death? Bad news, we would be lost forever. And so at this time, I'd like all of you to take and peel off that very top, very top part. Uh, let's see, is there a doctor in the house? Okay. All right. Bert, I'll be down there in a minute, okay? I'm bringing my, my, my juice to you down here. We're going to, okay. <laughs> Just easy. Okay. All right, so we've all got the... The uh, uh, wafer here that's represent re representing our Lord's body. And we think, Jesus, you're, you came to earth. You took upon you flesh. You were born, you lived, and you died. And Lord, we're so grateful. We do this in memory of him. We do this to remember just what he did for us. And we were thankful. So the night before Jesus was crucified, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Well, nobody likes to get a utility bill. And nobody likes to get a utility bill that's not correct. High, utili high utility bills are bad enough in the summers in Dallas. But even worse is if you get a bill and it's not correct. Well, this man whose name was Kieran Healy of Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, he got a water bill and it had the normal charge for his place, $189.92. Okay, so to water his property and to you know, maybe he took a lot of baths and everything. So it was $189.92. But then when he looked down the bill a little bit farther, get this. There was a service charge which had tacked on an additional $99,999,999 to the bill. 
So it was $1 short of a $100 million service charge. You know, you know what I, I know some of these places are kind of getting ridiculous with these service charges, but that's way off the charts. Okay, and you know what? That's something that wasn't just unwelcome, it was undoable. Okay? Now again, there's people on earth where it's chump change. If, can you believe that? That there's some people on earth that that's chump change, it's like a dollar bill. They can take that out and say, okay, well, I guess just pay it. <laughs> but you know what? To all of us, that would be like, uh, you know, I, I'm, I can't pay that if I, if I spent the rest of my life making a dollar an hour, I couldn't pay it. <laughs> you know, every single hour of every single day of every single year, there's no way. I couldn't do it. I couldn't pay. Okay, it's impossible. So he apparently hadn't used that much water the previous month, and he jokingly asked his water provider on Twitter if he could make installment payments. <laughs> That's what he wrote. He wrote a note to him and said, hey, I can't pay this in one lump sum, so would you be able to make, and can I make, pay this with installment payments? He was trying to get them to say, uh, oh, there's an obvious mistake. So that's what he wrote them. Well, the, the company right away got back with them and they said, hey, we're so sorry. This third party company that helps us send out payment reminders, something went bad and it put that on there. And so they took care of it and everything. I thought it was pretty funny that he didn't say, hey, fix my bill. He just said, hey, would you be able to do this on installments <laughs> and just let them figure it out? Gladly there wasn't some oaf in there like, uh, there you go, Charlie, we got our line two. Can you pick up line two? We got a guy here. Uh, he wants to put this on installments. How much would it be like if we had him pay it off over five years? How much would that be? <laughs> if he didn't realize that this is, okay, you get the idea. So, but anyway, as we take the cup now, as we take the cup, and now be careful as you peel off the next layer and, uh, Uh-oh, did we get new ones? Like, I can't get this off. There it is, I think. Okay, there we go. Patience, patience. What I was using that story to illustrate everybody is simply this. <laughs> Thank God for our Lord Jesus Christ. Because you know what? All of us had a, a bill like that that we could have never paid our sin debt <laughs> that had to be satisfied to a holy God, we could have never paid it. No way. I mean, there's nothing you and I could have do. Zero, zip, nada. I don't care if you became a monk and went off into a cave somewhere and never came out. It would not have mattered. We're all sinful through and through, and it took the blood of Jesus to give us eternal life. And so he shed his blood and he made us savable. He made it possible for us to have eternal life. And that's what we're going to thank and praise him for this morning. So the night before Jesus died, he took bread, I mean, he took the wine and he shared it with the disciples around him. And he said to them, this cup is the cup of the new covenant I'm making with you in my blood. I'm making a peace treaty with you, brothers. The forgiveness of sins forever, that's my offer. Would you like the forgiveness of sins? Well, it will come through what this represents. It will come through my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, Paul said, you do it in remembrance of Jesus. Our, our motto here, if you haven't been with us before, is we raise our cups and we say next time with Christ because that's what we hope the next time we share the Lord's Supper will be in his presence. So let's say it together. Ready? Next time with Christ. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'd like to lift up a prayer for you all. And uh, I want to just thank you for your kindness toward me and all the wonderful things that over the years that you've done and all the prayers you've lifted up. I believe that your prayers have sustained Kelly and I through the waters and through the fires and all the different things through all of us must pass through. 
I believe that our church is a prayerful church. And by the way, I want to invite everybody in the bulletin. It has a phone number you could either call in or you can go on your computer and literally go online and, and get on the screen with all the other. But on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, if you would rather just call in on your phone, we won't see you, but we'll hear you. You can share prayer requests and you could pray with us. One of our elders does a short Bible uh, lesson on Wednesday nights. And, and you know what? It's so easy to do. The numbers are in the bulletin that you could either, uh, or it's got the code in there you could put on your, uh, on your computer. But uh, I highly encourage you to join us because it's just a, a wonderful time of fellowship and prayer. And uh, it's encouraging. A middle of the week encouragement that we all need. And normally it takes between 30 and 45 minutes total. When we've had the Bible lesson, we've shared prayer requests, and we've prayed. So let me pray for all of you right now. Thank you so much. Father, we do praise you for our Lord Jesus, Father. Thank you that week after week people come and they say, feed us, Pastor Bob, feed us God's word so that we might glorify him. And Lord, I praise you for the opportunity to do that. I thank you for the blessing of being their pastor. I pray that you'll help all of this this week to be people of gratitude, to thank you for how you have taken care of us, and to be people of praise that will sing your praises to the people around us. Lord, help us to quit complaining. Lord, help us to quit being afraid. Lord, help us to quit being nervous about everything. Lord, help us to rest in you, to trust in you, that every day, Lord, with you, Lord, is a wonderful day that we're going to walk hand in hand with you. God, help us to remember that. Help us to live like that reality because it is lord you are with us you'll you will not leave us or forsake us god some folks here are just going through very difficult times right now in one way or another and none of us know it maybe lord be especially kind and gracious to them strengthen them encourage them and lord i just pray that if there's anyone here that isn't 100% sure that they'll be with you, that before they leave today, they'll come to me and say, Pastor Bob, I'm not 100% sure that I'm going to be in heaven when I die. And I sure would like to be. God, help that person or those people. It could be five people. Help them to come and see me after church where we could sit in my office and we could just go over this so they could drive home and lay their pillow or their head on their pillow tonight and know that if they were to die, they would go to be with you, Lord, in your presence. Lord, I know we have people in our church that are suffering because they've lost dear friends recently, Lord. Family and friends and Lord, we lift them up to you and ask that you would be kind and gracious and, and so helpful to them, Lord. And we pray all these things in your precious name and for your sake, Jesus. Amen. All right, have a great week, everybody.